there's nothing neutral about the movement of people. There's nothing apolitical about the creation of music. The United States is a conglomeration of massive waves of history. Well, any traditional music is, is part of a continuing stream of consciousness. And if it's a product of migration, it would have a lot of meaning suffused in it. The important thing is to connect the dots, to look at our history, which is a cultural history unlike any other nation. What reflecting on migration does, it requires us to sit in the fullness of the pain of that experience in order to really appreciate the beautiful things that emerge from it. So I'm born and I start hearing music. My parents are huge folk fans, the Kingston Trio and Pete Seeger. And I remember my teacher mentioned offhand, it's an Irish song. And so even just to know as a little kid, it's this music that you basically woke up to as a person is not from where you woke up. It's from another place. You know, most Americans think of Irish Americans as the immigrants who came to America after the Great Irish Famine in the middle of the 19th century. But there's an earlier uh, migration that in fact, a lot of Americans don't know much about it at all. That is the migration between 1700 and 1800 from the descendants of Scottish settlers who were planted in the north of Ireland by King James I in one of the biggest land grabs in Irish history and led a fairly unsteady existence. So when the opportunity came to come to America, they took it with open hands. They emigrated to Philadelphia and then down the Great Wagon Road. And out of that group of people would have came a distinctive Appalachian culture, which we know the music of as American old time music. So when the Scotch and the Irish came over here and that mixed with all of this like profoundly rhythmic music coming from Africa and hymns from the Lutheran hymnal, you kind of put all of that stuff together Bill Monroe is, is, is a person who grew up with all that stuff, and that's why bluegrass music sounds the way it does. The songs that, that I hear in Appalachia, one can find echoes of Ireland in them. I hear that kind of high lonesome sound, which is characteristic of Shannell singing in Ireland. You're singing like, her And I hear Ralph Stanley singing something like, Oh Death. Won't you spare me over till another year? The world tradition and it travels in mysterious ways. Music, when it goes over the wall, there's no knowing. There's no knowing where it ends up. The thing about Jews, they are a migrating people, it seems, anyway. The Jewish people of Eastern Europe this was a civilization that existed for a thousand years in Eastern Europe and Russia, continually in a state of tremendous cultural dynamism. And in this period of time, it did not build a Taj Mahal. It did not build the Tower of London. It was a culture entirely in the heads of the people. 1881 ushered in the era of pogroms and Cossacks coming through towns and slaughtering people. Many people who had their antenna out were understanding that the civilization of the Jews of Europe is coming to an end and it will be a violent and a horrible end. And if you can get out, get out. Between 1881 and 1924, two and a half million Jews left the Palace Settlement and came primarily to New York City and primarily to the Lower East Side of New York City. For many years, Second Avenue, the Yiddish theaters, was a thriving place. There were 200 Yiddish theaters around this country. There was a constant sliding back and forth. Irving Berlin, for instance, begins writing for the Yiddish theater, and then he migrates over into American theater. Songwriting was a business where all sorts of people could participate. There wasn't the prejudice that existed in other professions. There also, there were so many Broadway shows, there were so many opportunities for songs, they couldn't hire enough songwriters fast enough. 
All these writers consciously wanted to express America in their work. They loved the excitement, the pulse of what this country offered at that time. Parents spoke Yiddish between themselves and they excluded the child because they wanted the child to be an American. On one hand, it meant you were safe. If you're used to being persecuted for being what you are and then you can blend in, well, let's blend in. Then you have these second generation. I mean, Gershwin's, Bernstein's, Julie Stein. I mean, you can't hardly name an American songbook composer. And these were men and women who were writing for commerce, they were writing for assignment, and yet they had this faith and belief in the American dream. They were inspired on a level that is so extraordinary that we still feel it and get the same exhilaration when we experience it in the music. I think the reason why so many jazz musicians have roots to the Southern experience is that that is where I think a truly organic black cultural form developed. In the moment of the Great Migration, people knew they were doing something that was unprecedented. Because there had been such restriction on African American mobility for such a long time after the end of slavery, they had to be really aware that something was shifting in the country. Part of leaving the South was the terror that was created in the South. The terror of oppression, the terror of violence, and what that does for generations, people trying to escape for generations. And here's a moment where millions of people decide enough is enough and I have enough to get out. When you think about all of the musical potential that was unleashed when people had the opportunity to leave the South, commercialize their work, and popularize their work, whether it's Mahalia Jackson coming to Chicago and revolutionizing gospel music, the influence of Barry Gordy and Motown. You have a jazz musician is moving up from Kansas City, coming up to New York, sharing the music. The blues taking the boat up the Delta, finding its way to Detroit, Motown bursting. <laughs> For people who had been so constrained in their everyday life, people were remaking their identities during the Great Migration. But the thing they never believed behind is the sound they heard from where they were from. It never escapes it. The way Thelonious Monk plays, it, he never escapes the slur of the slang of North Carolina. That's what he plays when he's playing two notes right next to each other. It's impossible to treat the migration as an isolated event, and it's impossible to tell it in the company of the other events. You just have to start talking. This is how we understand the music we play. We know it's simply not just a piece of music that we set up here and then we play it and it's that simple, but that all those layers behind it for us are the things that we have to continue to bring to the front. Migration history isn't just about the history of one community moving into a new area. It's about how newcomers confront each other and what they sound like to each other. And I think we've only begun to explore the, the surface of the connections that happen when we all end up here together. The only reason America exists in the way that it does is because of the contributions of every culture from around the planet. I think that these migrations remind us that there are many American stories and there is nothing that requires our attention and our care more than ensuring that we are always striving to tell the fullest and most complicated story about our nation.